Angel, thank you for reading that text. Uh, an incredible uh, passage has just taken place, and now uh, we find ourselves in the synagogue in Capernaum, and Jesus is doing a little bit of explanation to the crowds who are offended at his hard teaching. The Passover is approaching quickly, this first and greatest festival in the calendar. And that's why all the imagery and all the words that we've been hearing throughout chapter 6, since 6-4 when it's first mentioned, give us this Exodus feel, this Passover feel. John wants us to see what Jesus is doing here through his words and his actions. And it's certainly been getting the attention of all these crowds who have been chasing Jesus up mountains and across lakes and uh, into Capernaum and finding him in the synagogue. They've literally been chasing him down, trying to extract from him what they believe religion and a messianic figure like this should be offering to them. They saw the miraculous feeding of the 5,000, the bread and the fish, and they thought that perhaps he would provide their food, like some kind of social program. He's going to give them their staple diet, like Moses had provided in the desert, through the quail and the manna. Confused about how he crossed the sea, perhaps some wondered, did he part the sea? Did he part the lake? Could this prophet liberate them from the Romans? Like, through Moses, God liberated the people of God from the Egyptians. Not knowing that actually he hadn't parted the seas, he'd walked on the water, more reminiscent of what Job describes of God doing. Let's make him king by force, they said. But of course, Jesus doesn't give them what they wanted. His PR and marketing team seem to have gone missing once again. It would be difficult, I think, to ever mistake Jesus as a, a people pleaser. Those of us who are Christians, I think, need to take note here. It's going to really help me with my point. <laughs> Compassion and kindness are not synonymous with being nice. Sometimes nice isn't compassionate or kind. Jesus gives them a hard teaching. Not one that is difficult to comprehend, but one that's tough to swallow. The truth often is, isn't it? The word here for hard can be translated harsh or offensive. Are you ever offended by things that you read that Jesus has said? Are you ever offended by what the Bible might say? The crowds are offended by what they misunderstood, because there is some major misunderstanding going on. But they're also offended by what they did understand. What was understood was that Jesus wasn't fulfilling their wish to be another Moses, but in fact is making claims that sound a bit more like he's saying he's God. He says, I am the bread of life. He doesn't say, I'm just going to bow to your demands and give you this social program that you want for daily bread. You don't need to settle for a daily Uber Eats delivery when you can have everlasting life. And he doesn't say, I'm going to provide all your political needs either. Don't settle for a political rescue from corrupt governance when you can be rescued from sin, Satan, and death. What they didn't understand was what Jesus meant by eating and drinking his flesh and blood. And to be fair, it sounds weird, doesn't it? The crowd wanted bread. Jesus said that he needed a different kind of bread. His flesh and blood. And it was a hugely controversial thing to say. Because in the law of Moses, they were banned from having any kind of meat that had 
blood still visible in it. Never mind drinking blood. It was forbidden. It was completely taboo. And it would have been as if they were eating and drinking death. You can see why it's controversial. I'm sure it's still uh, really fresh in your memory. But let me remind you of what we said back in June. uh, In verse 54 in the previous passage. About eating flesh and blood. And we said that it was the metaphorical version of verse 40. To believe. So to feed and drink on Christ's flesh and blood in 54, verse 54, is a metaphor for belief in verse 40. To feed on Christ is to believe. Augustine said it this way, believe and you have eaten. What would have become apparent just over a year later, after the next Passover, when Jesus is killed, is that this teaching is about a spiritual meal with Jesus that he will provide through the cross. And it is sufficient for eternal life. You'll never go hungry by feeding on him. If Jesus was what the people wanted him to be, and other Moses who, yeah, can provide bread and fish every day, and overthrow the Roman government, those things for sure would make a big difference to life for these people for a time. Of course it would. But only Jesus' offer of new life through his flesh and blood can bring true and everlasting life. Whoever feeds on this bread, Jesus said, will live forever. They've become so absorbed, these people, by their own ideas for what religion should offer, that they actually approach Jesus a little like he's a vending machine. It's what the Puritans describe as false worship or false religion. And we need to realize that it is actually rife today. I mean, people come to faith like it's a pick and mix at Woolworth circa 1995. There will never be a better pick and mix, just so you know. We so often come looking to extract what we think we need to add to the lives that we are already building. Instead of coming and saying, actually, we need Jesus for all of life. We need to come and submit to him and to all of his words, rather than coming and saying, Uh, You know, I like what the Bible says in Mark 3. Take that one, stick it in the wee bag, keep going. Oof, Romans 2. No, (laughs) thank you. Um, But I will take this. We kind of have started to treat faith like that. As if we get to decide what to include and what not to include. That is not the goal. We need to come to Jesus and say to him, you've got all of me. Come and shame me. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to live for you. Like these Israelites chasing Jesus through the hills, across lakes and into synagogues, too many of us have become religious end users. And churches run more like businesses than families. Religious end users are still often seeking salvation. Salvation from this, salvation from that. They want to escape a particular existence to find a better one. Nothing wrong with that. But as they decide on what should be included, it's those people, it's them, it's they who are deciding rather than trusting God for how it should look. They create a trap for themselves, a pattern of life that actually just ends up being perpetual disappointment. Highs and lows. And it's no surprise that John describes the people here as grumbling, mumbling. Not for the first time in this chapter, We see a groaning people, and it should remind us again of the Exodus. 
Because when God saves them from the Egyptians and they end up in the desert, of course, what happens? They start to grumble. It was better in Egypt. Let's just go back there. What are you doing taking us out here? It's like going from one exodus to another. And it's no surprise that this crowd starts to disappear. Now, I don't know how closely you have followed the Syrian and other uh, refugee groups who have been fleeing war in these past years in an attempt to get to Europe. It was heartbreaking to see what happened to beautiful places like Aleppo turn to rubble. And when people escape with their lives, they then often faced a perilous journey over the Adriatic or the Mediterranean. And the relief for reaching Greece or Italy was enormous, and yet their troubles weren't over. One exodus led to another. They found themselves stuck in camps, unable to work, often spending months in squalor, some even dying in places like the Macedonian border because they were too cold, dying of hypothermia, or because they didn't have enough to eat. It's a travesty. And many of us live our lives like that. Imagine reaching that point where you assumed salvation had come, when you would be given the freedom that that you so desired to start a new life. And then you find yourself trapped again, unable to start that new life. But what if there was a final exodus? An ultimate exodus where a people escape slavery forever and who can never be chained up again and eternally enjoy the freedom that they are made for. Jesus, as we so often see, he gets right to the heart of things with a question. Verses 62 and 63 are really one open question. Where there is plain and there is hidden meaning. In the plain meaning, Jesus asks the question, uh, well, I already said that I have come from my Father in heaven, verse 38. So if you were to see me ascend before you into the sky and go back to him into heaven, wouldn't you believe then? That's the plain meaning. Surely that would be the proof that they needed. So why not look out for my ascension when the time comes? And of course, that's what we see at the beginning of Acts. We have it recorded for us. Jesus ascends into the sky before witnesses who are then to go and tell the world about what they have seen, including the ascension. We know Jesus was truly from heaven because after he died, he rose again from the dead and then he returned to heaven. When I ascend, will you believe then? But surely, there is a hidden meaning here too. One that relates to this offense, to this stumbling block, this flesh and blood issue that they're finding so difficult to understand. Now, I don't think anyone in the crowd is going to understand in this moment. But Jesus is placing dots. And when the time comes... Those who believe will be able to draw the lines between the dots. He's talking about the means of his ascension to heaven for the rest of us. They had misunderstood Jesus' words as a literal eating of his body. Baffled by it. But actually what Jesus is saying is potentially even more offensive. Because he calls himself the son of man here, which we know from our previous study in John, means that he is both God and man. And he is saying to them that God himself will be the sacrificial lamb. Now remember, this is their approaching Passover. He will be the bloody sacrifice. He will be the one who is put onto the cursed cross. If there's anything more offensive to this this crowd than what he's already said and they've misunderstood, it's what he's actually saying. That God will be crucified. 
So when Jesus says, the flesh is to no avail or of no use in verse 63, he is referring back to that misunderstanding, to the controversial statements about eating and drinking flesh and blood. Understood, as the crowd did, it was useless. But when they hear rumours of his rising and ascension, wouldn't they remember the cross and these words as Passover approaches? These are the words that will bring them truth in life. Jesus is saying, I will give you true spiritual life by drawing humanity to myself through the cross. The cross is our salvation and the ultimate exodus we all need. Isn't it wonderful the way Jesus is continuing to place these dots? Drawing lines from heaven to earth and the womb, from his life to the cross and the tomb, and from his rising from the grave to his ascension and return soon. There's our exodus from slavery to sin and the overcoming of Satan and death to a new life and freedom with God. But who gets to enjoy that? Jesus is clear. It's those who believe in him and those who believe are those who God draws. Jesus is actually answering the rhetorical question that was asked back in verse 60 in that grumbling. Now he answers it in verses 64 and 65. Who can believe this hard teaching? Those who God draws. Those whose hearts are quickened by the Spirit of God as they hear the words of Jesus, who God wakes from the dead. We need new life. And although we are still responsible for our choices without being woken up and made alive to Christ, we are the walking spiritually dead. As Paul will write to the churches in Ephesus, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. The dead cannot raise the dead. We are powerless without God breathing new life into us. We need intervention, verse 65. No one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws them. Now the culture that we are a part of has many quirks, many unique beliefs. If we start to study our culture versus just about any other culture that has gone before, we will discover that we are strange. And there are many beliefs that we hold as a culture that just don't add up for most others who have lived in different times and places over the years. One of them is this unique entitlement that we feel for a full life. As if we deserve God's love. As if we deserve all the good things that are available in the world. Of course we do. We are human beings. Don't we deserve all of this goodness? To most, that is a very strange view of the world. Here's how the author, Os Guinness, puts it in his latest book. Too many modern people live as if society is indebted to them and they are owed a life. When the fact is that our existence itself is a wonder. And we should ask to whom or to what we owe the response that our lives should be. It is a wonder that God in his love and compassion draws near at all. Praise God, he does. He does not leave us in death, but comes to bring us life through the Son and by the power of the Spirit for anyone who would believe. That is a hard teaching. In our culture, that is a very hard teaching. I struggle with it at times. I'm sure many of you do. 
But what, we have a decision to make. Do we trust God even when we don't understand? The plain reading of the text, I think it's not just clear here, but all over the Bible. So what do we do? Do we trust him even when we don't quite get it? Or do we try and have a pick and mix religion? Here comes the scene from the end of the night, verse 66. Imagine an empty room after a gig or that field strewn with plastic cups spread out all over the place after the crowds have dispersed. You can imagine the quiet and strange feeling for those left behind. Where the crowds go and what they believe cannot be the measure for truth and life. They've disappeared. Jesus said that the broad road leads to destruction and the narrow, narrow path to life. The few will find it. In the NIV, the translation we read, says that many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. But the NASB and the ESV say no longer walked with him and actually that I think that picks up a little better on the nature of true discipleship a rabbi would often walk with his disciples and teach them on the road along the journey and they would walk and teach and as he walked and teached that is how you knew that you had followers because they would keep coming with you it's a bit different for rabbis and Jesus. Jesus reversed something there, which was really important because rabbis in so many ways um, had all kinds of tests for how you come in. For Jesus, it was only about belief. But those who remained disciples, how would you know? They kept walking with you. They kept following you. And like Enoch, the first to follow God after Adam and Eve, the Bible says he walked with God. It was an early sign that God would find a way to walk again with his people. Out of his compassion and his love, his goodness, he was going to make sure that he would seek out his people and walk with them again. I love the RSV version. It's like the Glasgow version. They no longer went about with him. Who are you going about with? I'm going about with Jesus. Are you going about with Jesus? Are you going to keep walking with them even when it doesn't make sense to you? Even when it gets hard? Even when you're offended? Do you trust them ultimately? And will you give them your life? As Jesus sits with his disciples in that empty synagogue, he asks, you don't want to leave too, do you? No. Bearing in mind everything Jesus just said about knowing who his true disciples were, he's not asking for his own benefit. Continuing to walk with Jesus along the route he was taking was going to get narrower and narrower. And he's, he's getting them to process. He's getting them to face the realities of what it is to walk with God. Jesus doesn't want them to be unaware and pretend like it's not happening. Just put your hands in your ears, over your ears, and la, 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 la. Life's really hard, but we don't really want to know about it. He doesn't encourage that. He gets them to confront it. He might as well be asking them, are you a religious end user too? Someone who is only here while it complements the rest of your goals and beliefs? Or are you an immersive worshipper? Are you in no matter what? Despite the uphills, are you still willing to follow Jesus? Will you trust that even when you don't know, he does? All of Israel is getting ready for the first 
and greatest festival of the year, the Passover. And as they walk up to Jerusalem, they would be singing the Psalms of Ascension, these songs of hope as they approach the presence of God on the Mount of God in Jerusalem, in that temple, ready to bring a sacrifice. And those Psalms of Ascent reflect something of that exilic journey of life. Jerusalem was at one of the highest points in Israel, and the uphill struggle to reach the city is like life, often harder than it is easier. We live in one of the most prosperous and privileged societies that there has ever been. Yet I wouldn't imagine anyone in this room would say that life at times is not hard. Life can often feel like an uphill battle. The Israelites looked up to Jerusalem and the temple in hope, worshipping God and calling on him for help and salvation. As to deal with money problems, real life problems, family problems. Someone they know and love is ill. They're ill. They fear death. Feelings of despondency. Maybe they're down, depressed. And yet, as a community, they're committed together to singing hopefully on the road. Psalm 121, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. Psalm 130, I will wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I will wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. He sang these songs as a declaration that although life wasn't what it should be, that their enemies persisted and their sins prevailed, they still hoped in God. Although they took sacrifices with them, ready to be killed as an offering for their sin, they did so in the hope that God himself would come and save them. That he would redeem them from their lives and sin and the muck that they find themselves in. I'm at an age and um, part of a generation where many of my friends who were coming regularly to church and were saying and doing the right things for many years have been deconstructing. Some to the point that they have simply walked away. And in the disappointments and trials, I've had to ask that question too. I don't want to leave too, do I? Hard times will come. We will face trials. But will we worship him anyway? Will we trust him anyway? Will we keep singing and climbing? Do we trust that he is leading us up the mountain to an unsurpassing glory, a place of worship and wonder? Even when we are filled with doubt or we don't know all the answers, let's keep singing songs of hope. Hope not in a redeemer still to come, one where we had to kind of try and work out what he would look like and what, how God would save us like the Israelites had to, but we have in Jesus the answer. We know where our hope is. We know who he is. It's Jesus. He saved us and he will return to make all things right. Peter is often the first one to speak, isn't he? So it doesn't surprise us that he's the first one to speak here again. Shoots from the hip. And it doesn't always work out too well for him. But this time, it does. He makes a declaration in that empty synagogue that is like a song of ascent in his heart. 
Like the crowd more interested in being religious end, end users where 30 pieces of silver are enough to draw them away, Judas will walk away in an act of dreadful betrayal. Like many in the crowd, I imagine Judas was hugely conflicted and pained at what to do. It's not like we don't have compassion here. But ultimately, he chooses the easy thing. Instead of trusting, Jesus still knows what he is doing as he leads us along the narrow path. He chooses the easy way, the instant benefit. Let's, like Peter, declare the truth. Where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Like the singing of worship on the way to Jerusalem, we must sing with the hope of Zion. The heavenly city of God where Jesus is enthroned forevermore. For not only was Jesus raised on the cross, but he rose again from the dead and he ascended on high. Our hope is not in here. It's not inside back on the cross and there ahead of us on the throne and there we will worship every single part of us in every single way will be worshipful for that is why we were made it's our whole design not just singing but in all we are and do the final destination of this exodus is worship. And nothing will thrill your heart more. R.C. Sproul puts it this way, worship isn't a means to an end, but the end of all means. We have passed through the waters and entered the kingdom that Jesus has established for us. And as wonderful as it is, it's not the end. We must continue to follow Jesus along the narrow path up the hill. Through this life, we are heading to a destination. And it's eternal worship before God. And right at the heart of it will be this man with the words of life. Jesus, King Jesus reigning and ruling on his throne. Revelation 5 says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands, ten times, <laughs> and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise that I heard every creature in heaven and, earth on, and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. That's what you're made for. Immersive, all-consuming, every moment worship. Not religious consumerism. It's all or nothing. So, even in the confusion, will you worship? Will you declare the goodness of God even on a part of the path where you feel scared? Even on a part of the path where you feel alone or sad? Will you trust that one day you will worship him face to face when you will know no fear and live in perfect unity with God and his people and be filled with everlasting joy? And as you do, would you keep calling on his name and trusting the power of the Holy Spirit to sustain you, who cries out within you, Abba Father, who is the one who is in you, the making you a temple of his spirit so that you might worship him all the way to that glorious place. Until we reach heaven's joys, we remember our redemption 
our Passover lamb. And so together, we are going to take communion as an act, as a declaration to say that our hope is in Jesus, that we're willing to give him our all. We're coming to the flesh and the blood to say no. What the world has to offer is not enough. I want it all. I want Jesus.